In the next series of videos, I'm going to pass along the tips that I found uh, from experience, both for 107 operators and then also for recreational uh, pilots. Um, I've operated all over the country and have learned the hard way of what works and what doesn't work. And so I'm going to point out some tips that are obvious, and I'm going to get the nickname Captain Obvious for some of this. But at the same time, I'm going to point out some things that um, aren't obvious and I found out to be very helpful. So let's get started. The first off, um, if you're using a um, iOS device, I have no experience uh, with I have no experience with Android devices, but I'm pretty sure it would probably be the same thing. Um, actually, I have a dedicated um, iPad Pro. It's an older 10 and a half that I use as a uh, controller. Um, and I have it set up with minimal applications on it, no email accounts, no notifications, because the less that's going on in the background, the better. The absolute worst thing to do is have a notification on your device saying that your application has been interrupted by another application. And so my, high, my first suggestion is with your device, have a minimal device, turn off all the auto updates from Apple or from Google, whoever supplying your updates, and then also the less notifications you have in the background, the absolute best situation you'll have down the road. That being said, I don't totally like being dependent on any apps. I try to back myself up where I go with some paper, as you saw in my paperwork video. Also, I do some pre-flight, the minimal requirements before I leave the house. So in case I get there and the apps don't work, I have a, a course of action that I can still fly. And it, nothing's worse than to travel to a location, even if you know you've got good cell phone coverage, and find out your apps don't work. And that's happened to me. Uh, several times and um, I have used the before you fly app a tip with that is once you get a successful green pre-flight on the before you uh, fly app take a screen capture so you have it for your records also with air map um, I've had the same experience I've gone out in the field an area good LTE coverage and for some reason the app doesn't work on my one of my more recent uh, trips what happened to me was I got there and neither before you would fly would work air map wouldn't work I had to download uh, Eloft the new kitty app act in the field set up an account uh, and then use Kitty Hawk for uh, the mainly for the mapping purposes uh, it was uh, right on the edge of class D airspace and I wanted to make sure that I really was outside of that class D airspace and I'd already basically looked at the weather requirements and the other pre-flight requirements that all of us, whether we're a 107 operator or a recreational pilot, have to look at. So do not be overly dependent on phone apps. Have a minimal device and turn off all your auto updating or anything else that might interfere with your primary app. Another big tip is if uh, you're dealing with the U.S. government, um, let alone the FAA, it's a whole lot easier on a Windows 10 machine using the Chrome browser. Um, I'm primarily a Mac user, but for my business things I do, I have a Windows 10 machine that I use. And it's amazing how much easier the whole experience is with all the different government agencies 
using a Windows computer. Um, I just want to pass along a tip. If you're taking as a 107 operator the recurrent, and this is on a Windows 10 machine with the Chrome browser, which is one of the recommended browsers, you may not be able to submit the completed test. You'll complete it, all the sections will be done, all the modules will be done, and you go to hit the submit button. If you leave that page looking for the submit button, of course you'll lose your results. Um, the answer, and I ended up having to take the test a second time, and is to go through when you're all done and click on the module numbers at the top of the page. It makes absolutely no sense why you have to do that, but we've got some great guys in the UAS program with the FAA. It's just the FAA website uh, infrastructure is just horrible, not only for drones, but for fixed-wing pilots. And I'm going to show you the sectional charts that they give you. Their resolution is unusable. It's all full of noise and artifacts from being overly compressed. And I'm going to show you uh, what it is to use a commercial uh, vendor's uh, product. Sky Vector does an excellent job, much more legible, and they're basically derived from the same uh, purpose. But tip, use Windows 10 and uh, for everything. The Before You Fly app is not supported on uh, the, the Safari browser on the Mac. It works great on Chrome on a Windows 10 machine. And so that's another big tip, another lesson to learn is if you're going to interface with the U.S. government, you better use Windows, particularly if you deal with the passport office. But that's a whole other story. If you travel with your drone, you're going to end up in remote areas where you will not have satellite coverage. This forces you to operate in the attitude mode called ADDI on DJI drones. And it's helpful if you've practiced with this, but it's very, very hard to stay proficient in all the basic flight maneuvers if the wind's blowing. So there are a few recommendations that I have. One is if you're flying the drone, follow it by walking behind it or at least have it fly away from you. That way all your control inputs are exactly the same. It becomes more difficult as the drone's coming at you or being flown from a side vantage point. So if you're flying in attitude mode, it's much, much easier if the drone is flying away from you. And uh, so it's going to happen. It used to be in the earlier DJI drones, you could turn off uh, the uh, all the GPS stuff and just practice. I don't recommend doing that. Um, my solution early on was I started with cheap toy drones, but a little bit of caution there. A lot of them have extremely limited Wi-Fi range and are very, very subject to flyaway. And uh, remember, if you have a license and you inflict $500 damage on a house or a vehicle, that's considered an accident by the FAA. So my recommendation is go to a sparse field with nothing around and practice there away from all things that could be valued more than $500 in practice, flying the basic figure eight maneuvers and things like that. But in the real world, um, it's best to just always have the drone flying away from you. I know that that seems to be a cop out, but you know we practice it so infrequently that it, it can be really helpful. The only time I've ever crashed my drone was in a situation where I had no satellite coverage. I was high in the Rocky Mountains, and then apparently the satellites were blocked, and I backed into a tree flying in adding mode. And uh, anyway, that's my tip. My next series of uh, tips are somewhat interrelated. Uh, the first one I'm going to say is seek the high ground. And this is important uh, for two reasons. One is visibility, being able to see your drone. And uh, especially with kind of an interrelated uh, tip, and that is that I use an anti-collision light for the daytime to increase my ability to see my drone from a line of sight uh, situation. I have much greater ability to spot uh, my drones against a forest background, uh, particularly with my original Mavic Air. It's black and it blends in real easily 
It's easy to lose sight of the drone at 100 yards. With an anti collision flashing light on it, it almost doubles or triples the usable visibility for, for me to be able to see that drone. And then also with my Mavic Air 2, um, the gray color again is a natural camouflage. I really wish um, DJI would go with the Autel bright orange colors, but uh, I guess the uh, grays and blacks are more marketable. But anyway, first tip, seek the high ground, and uh, there's a real advantage to being able to do that in high country. Uh, a lot of the places that I operate in the Rocky Mountains or in mountainous terrains, um, if you're at the base of the valley and you're flying along the sides of the valley, your drone can say that you've reached 400 feet um, AGL, but you're really not 400 feet above the ground. You may only be 50 feet above the ground up on those hillsides. So if you start in the hillside, you can train follow the valley down towards the valley, but you can't do the opposite if you start down in the valley and fly up the hillsides. So tip number one is seek the high ground. Tip number two is have an alley collision light on that you can see during the daytime. And tip number three is be proficient at both hand launching and hand landing your drone. Uh, there are going to be times where you're going to be operating in very tight confines on the side of a hillside or in a forest area that you, you'll be able to see your drone. It's just you won't have a very uh, large area to maneuver for normal takeoffs and landings or return to home. So there's some advantages to being able to uh, hand launch the drone and hand recover the drone. Finally, I'd like to conclude with uh, a clip that I shot using these techniques flying along a hillside with beautiful fall color in Colorado. The fall color in Colorado is just spectacular. It doesn't last very long, so if you're out there, cherish it. It's a beautiful place in the fall. Hit that like button if this helped you. Please subscribe.
And if you want to get notified of my next video, hit that bell.